Hey guys, Corey here with another concept video. Today, it's all about the endocrine system. In this video, we'll take a look at the properties of hormones and discuss various types. We'll also outline a few specific examples of where they're used. So let's get started. Unlike nerves, hormones are actually chemicals that are produced by cells and carried in the blood to bring about an effect somewhere else in the body. They're usually produced by endocrine glands and control activities or maintain homeostasis in a wide range of areas from things like growth, reproduction, salt concentration, glucose concentrations and blood temperature. You can think of hormones like tiny letters written by parts of your body and then carried through the blood to other parts of the body where their message can be read and then used. You actually have many different types of endocrine glands in your body and some main examples are things like the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, the adrenal glands and the ovaries and testes. These glands all produce different types of hormones with different messages. Now there are actually three different types of hormones which you should know and learn. They are peptides, which consist of a peptide chain of amino acids, proteins, which are much larger 3D structures and derived from tyrosine, and finally steroids, which are lipid-based and insoluble in water. Now the three different types have different properties as well as pros and cons, with the biggest probably being that protein and peptide hormones are often polar in nature. This means that they do not travel into the cell and as a result their message is transmitted into the cell when they bind to receptors on a target cell membrane. Steroid hormones on the other hand are lipid but not water soluble and bring about their effect by traveling into the cell and binding to internal receptors. This usually means that protein and peptides have a faster mode of action than lipid hormones as they can travel through the blood easier because it's a water medium whereas lipid hormones which can diffuse into the cell and stay there longer are normally considered to be longer lasting. Now some good examples of each type of hormone can be seen in this table. Insulin and glycogon are types of peptide hormones produced by your pancreas and control blood sugar levels. Adrenaline and thyroxine are types of protein hormones produced by the adrenal and thyroid gland and have varied uses in controlling blood sugar levels, increasing and decreasing heart rate and stimulating metabolism. And finally estrogen and progesterone are types of lipid hormones that help maintain female and male reproductive systems and are known as sex hormones. Now that we have a general overview of hormones, let's take a look at some specific examples of their use. And let's start with how they control metabolism rates. Now metabolism refers to the vast array of biochemical reactions occurring in an organism, and among the most important of these are the cellular respiration reactions which release energy. Thyroxine is actually a hormone produced by the thyroid gland, which is then secreted into the circuitry system and acts on most cells in the body to help regulate metabolism. Levels of thyroxine are actually controlled by another hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone. And an example of how they work can be seen in this diagram. If thyroxine levels fall and energy production decreases, it is detected by receptors in the hypothalamus region of the brain. The hypothalamus then secretes thyrotropin releasing hormone, which stimulates the anterior pituitary gland to release thyroid stimulating hormone. The thyroid stimulating hormone then travels through the bloodstream to the thyroid gland, which then releases thyroxine. And finally, the increased levels of thyroxine increase metabolic rate and thus stimulate energy release. This is yet another example of negative feedback helping to maintain homeostasis. Let's have another look at an example and take a look at how hormones maintain blood glucose levels. Similar to what was discussed in the nervous system video, these hormonal actions are examples of stimulus response models that help maintain homeostasis. In this case, it's important to keep blood sugar levels around about 75 to 95 milligrams per deciliter, and if they fall outside these ranges, negative feedback will occur to pull these levels back into line. Let's now take a look at how this specifically happens and how hormones are involved. We'll start by looking at what happens when a decrease in blood glucose levels occurs. These low levels are first detected by chemoreceptors in the pancreas. The pancreas will then be stimulated to secrete glycogon, which travels through the blood to the effectors, which in this case is the liver. The liver is then stimulated to increase the breakdown of glycogen to glucose, which is then secreted into the blood to increase blood glucose levels. As we've seen in previous videos, this is an example of negative feedback as the response reversed the stimulus. Now if blood glucose levels get too high, the pancreas is stimulated to secrete insulin instead of glycogon. This insulin then travels through the blood to the effectors in this case muscles and liver cells, which are then stimulated to absorb more glucose and convert the storage of them to glycogen. 
This then allows for the lowering of blood glucose levels and a maintenance of homeostasis. Controlling blood glucose levels is really important and the inability to do so can result in conditions such as diabetes. Diabetes actually occurs as a result of the body's inability to produce or control insulin levels and results in an imbalanced glucose level. This can then result in a range of issues such as headaches, nausea or even seizures. The last example I'd like to talk about is what's called osmoregulation or the control of water slash solute levels in cells. Osmoregulation is really important as changing solute concentrations in cells can affect rates of osmosis, which can cause cells to either shrink or swell. As before, let's use a diagram to help illustrate the specific negative feedback mechanism for osmoregulation. In this case, let's assume that the stimulus is a decrease in blood volume, a decrease in blood pressure, and therefore an increase in solute concentration in cells. This stimulus is detected by osmoreceptors, which are a type of chemoreceptor in the hypothalamus. This then stimulates the release of antidiuretic hormone from the pituitary gland into the bloodstream. The antidiuretic hormone then travels in the blood to the kidney, where it enables kidney tubules and collecting ducts to act as the effector and remove more water from the filtrate and ensure less is lost in urine. The reabsorption of water then increases the volume and pressure and decreases the solute concentration. And again, this is an example of negative feedback. Well, that's it for the endocrine system. I hope it helped, and as always, check back soon for more content videos. Thank you.